some of our layout is very... p &O's chairman, Lord Stirling, is meeting with the designers to assess plans for the public rooms of the new superliner Aurora. We need to be very careful as to how we coordinated the connections between each architect's space. So we needed to draw them together on a number of occasions uh, to check that, for instance, uh, when you moved along a corridor from one public area to another, which had been designed by different architects, um, that there was a precise fit and that there was going to be a natural transition from one space to the other. So we had to, we had to, we had to be very, very careful in how we managed that process. With my own wife, for argument's sake, I can tell you, yeah. we'll not even go up a step like that. There's a feeling of uh, that you might slip through, or you can see down. And well, you, you can't see down because the step protrudes underneath the one above it, so you will only see right. it straight if you're on. At an angle. Yeah. You but anyway, it as can a I leave? Can can see in presentation, it looks it looks very attractive. Yeah. I think what I am saying to you is, we've had so many examples, and you always find it when we do the yeah. gifts, uh, yeah. the gift ceremony, which we've usually used, used that as an area. Yeah. You're continually making very careful all the time. And a number of times people have slipped. There have been quite a few accidents in the States on that. It's a very smooth finish. Yes, it will, it will be. Yes. 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 But the, the, we should emphasize that it's only the first flight that is marble. Right. Meanwhile, deep in the heart of the English countryside, another different kind of work of art is underway. John Mills, a graduate from the Royal College of Art, is perhaps most famous for his three-metre bronze entitled Blitz, which stands outside London's St. Paul's Cathedral. For Aurora, John's been commissioned to make a ten-metre tall bas relief that'll dominate the ship's main atrium. This came about um, because the, the company Watermark hydrodynamics of Dun Dun Fountains with me and in this case they wanted a sculpture to go in front of the fountain they were doing for Aurora um, and so I work I'm working directly with them. Um, they came up with a tiny drawing of an idea of, of a traditional um, psyche at the world kind of sculpture and I said well if I would do it as long as that it was done my way and uh, so I produced a maquette, a sketch model. Um, and the company p and agreed to that. Um, so we produced uh, the big one from that, so it was scaled up. Um, the final piece is 30 feet high, seven foot wide, uh, with a full waterfall behind it and free water flowing through it. A um, few problems, a few technical problems. Um, like on fixing down in the ship, that's an important aspect of, of uh, the technical side of sculpture because of the lean of the ship. In this case, the water has to stay put in up to 18 degrees of lean. So the way the water flows down the sculpture is uh, very important, and it's part of the modeling to make the water stick to the wall, as it were. So that's the one technical aspect. We actually made the piece by carving it in polystyrene. Polystyrene is quite a facile material. Um, and it enables you to work very quickly and you can get any surface finish you like on it. But it enables us to work on that scale um, with less equipment because you can handle the big pieces quite easily because of the light weight. So that's the way we're doing it. From, from the polystyrene carving, um, rubber moulds are made and we will be making it look like lalique glass. So it will be a kind of faux vert. Um, made of resin GRP. It will be translucent so light will be able to shine through it and then water running through it as well. So it's quite an interesting piece of sculpture. Illumination, but to give a general soft illumination over the whole thing. It works, it works really well. Yeah, I think we should have you standing behind the real thing with that light. The, yeah. the effect is, is very, very good through the, the texture of the polystyrene. Mm -hmm. so well, we've been working on it for about a year eight or nine months now. Um, we have the casting to complete and the colouring to complete and then uh, we'll take it to Papenburg and actually erect it uh, in the ship which has to be completed by January, February. So about a year in, in all. In Papenburg it's time for the keel laying ceremony. It's the start of putting the massive steel blocks together and is an emotional occasion 
even if it wasn't Christmas. Inside the huge shed in which the ship will be built, thousands of Mayor Verf workers gather to witness the ceremony as the keel, block number one, is lowered into place. It's tradition to place coins under the body of the hull and as the managing director of a 200-year-old family firm, Bernard Mayer isn't one to buck the system. Blocks will arrive fast and furious now. Mayor Verft have committed themselves to completing the ship in 14 months. Most of the blocks will be assembled here at the yard itself, but some, like those containing the stabilizers, have been subcontracted to other companies. The reason for that is to help speed up the manufacturing process. We speed up the production for those kinds of ships tremendously. We have concentrated on building passenger ships. We have, of course, consequently optimized our production, the system of building ships, the block system as we call it, or the Lego system. There'll be 62 blocks in Aurora. Block number one was the start of the keel, and number 62 is the funnel, which goes on last mainly because it can't be fitted inside the hall itself, as it's too tall. The block system may seem to have removed some of the romance from shipbuilding, but it's methodical and understandable to everyone involved in the project. Like on the Galera, boom, boom, every week a new block is coming. So the block system, consequently, was a new system where everybody on the shipyard could follow. He knows block number XYZ is coming in week XYZ, so we have to bring all the material, the logistic, to this block in time. And by this we could optimize the production tremendously. And it's not all high-tech. Plain old chalk has a serious role to play. The operation is timed down to, if not the second, then the day. As each block is completed and put in place, others are being constructed from the steel sheets. As the sheets are welded together, the sheer scale of the operation becomes more and more apparent. put on the profiles and put on the walls, the gears and so on, and from step by step uh, we came to a section, and the section, uh, 10 sections, build a block, and uh, we build up the blocks up to 600 tons. This is a maximum weight uh, because of our cranes. blocks aren't just hollow shells. As much piping and wiring is fixed into each block as is possible, as it's made. We can work outside in the workshops or in the block because the, the walking time is less and you can work easier and better outside in the block than on board. That's why we try in the block to put all the coordination, the piping, ventilation, electrical fittings and so on. It's this system of prefabrication, building as much as possible into each block, that has enabled the yard to shorten construction time, and that's impressed the engineers at P&O. In the pre-planning of the ship design, they're trying to optimise that to allow uh, more 
prefabrication of modules, machinery modules, cabin modules, um, technical modules throughout the ship so that once the hull starts building they can drop these prefabricated modules in and it speeds up by a great extent the actual production process at the end. As the prefabricated blocks begin to build up, Aurora starts to look like a massive doll's house. Just a few hours away by road from Papenburg in Bremerhaven is a more traditional yard, SSW. Unlike Mayor Werft, whose building dock is at water level, SSW still has a slipway. But they too have worked for PO before. 20 years ago, or longer, a bit longer, we built first two vessels are calling Norland and North Star. And then we have built uh, four or five years ago some ferries. They are crossing the channel from Seabrugge to Dover. SSW has been subcontracted to build and deliver four blocks, including the block that will contain the stabilizers which themselves have been delivered from Italy and now have to be fitted into the blocks. We get the contract in the middle of last year, so let's say in July, June and July 1998, for four blocks. From the pre-assembling to or till launching, we need roughly five months. This block is from the dimension side 32.1 meter. The length is uh, about 20 meters and the height up to the third deck 8.1 meter. Our maximum res is 30 meters on the slipway and these blocks are 32 meters. Therefore we have also a different way to launch these blocks. After this launching we have to make a function test of the stabilizer fin boxes or the stabilizer fins you see behind me. And uh, we have also the function test of both sides before we going r right through the river Weser to uh, Papenburg. And so, with not a bottle of champagne in sight, the block is launched down the slipway. almost gets away. The small southern Indian state of Goa is associated in the minds of most Europeans with great beaches, hippie markets and holidays. Yet for P&O, it's long been a place for people, people to man their ships. Around 50% of the staff on P&O liners are from India, and at one stage, most of those were going. They are strong. P&O's links to India are just as strong. And it was the first liner company to open a permanent office here in Mumbai. As a result of Aurora, there are some 600 vacancies, and the initial interviews alone took a solid 13 days. We are one of the first cruise companies to have had a manning office in Bombay, in India for that matter. And when you start off a company of your own, then you know that you have recruited so many people, you are keeping a track of these people when they are on leave, like when they report to you for medicals. You get your trained people back uh, when, when you are, want them back on board. Yes, sir. About right. A lot of cruise companies all over the world are looking forward to, like, you now they recruit people from India because there is an inbuilt uh, tendency to actually like, you know, be hospitable, you know, welcome people, be nice to them. The other thing is we have a lot of skilled labor. 
in India. We have lots of colleges which actually teach you catering, hospitality management and all. And it's, it's because again, like, you know, we have so many people and uh, uh, they get paid a lot more if they work abroad, if they work outside India, which is a very big incentive for them. I think that's, that's for staff to man the new P&O liner, Aurora. We prefer people who have passed out of catering colleges and have had uh, their fair bit of experience in the industry. So that like, no, we are not recruiting very raw hands because the cruise industry is something very different. Uh, in a restaurant, you have four people coming in and uh, take about two, two and a half hours to actually get over the meal, three courses. But compare this to a cruise ship. You have a six course menu, 1,800 people to be fed. You have one and a half hours to actually finish all these six courses. So to mold these people to our requirements, we need a, a, a little bit of time. So a lot of times we take them at a lower category. They could have worked as an assistant waiter or a waiter in a, in a good hotel in India. But we offer them a job of uh, an assistant to that or a utility steward or an assistant cabin steward. And then mold them to our requirements and they are ready for a promotion to a high, higher post. But a lot of guests on the bus. Training and retraining is carried out at both P&O's Mumbai office and at the nearby catering college. Bistro is a particular style of restaurant. We put people through a refresher training every time they go on board, before they go on board. Uh, this is to refresh their minds about what are the company policies, if there has been any change in policies, uh, we inform them about it. Refresh their uh, minds about the hygiene standards. Because you've been on leave for three months and uh, you've got like, no, you enjoying yourself with the family, you put your, put your mind frame like, no, back into the, into the job. Uh, it's a one day session that we do before they join. Back in the much colder climes of northern Germany, the stabilizer blocks are on their way up the river from Bremerhaven. The shipyard is, rather bizarrely, not on the coast but 45 kilometers up the River Ems. As bigger and bigger ships were built, the river had to be dredged so that they could be taken down to the sea, causing a huge political row. Now the yard is putting forward a controversial plan to build a barrier to raise the water levels. Environmentalists are again incensed, claiming that fish in the river will be wiped out by the effects of the barrier and are trying to block it. But Mayor Werft is in one of the poorer areas of Germany and virtually the whole town of Papenburg relies on it, directly or indirectly, to make a living. The workers at Meyer Werft are determined to protect their jobs and get the ship down to the sea.